Hi, everybody. I'm Faith Sidlow, and I am a professor at Fresno State in California. I'm joined here by my colleagues in the Global News Relay. I'm going to introduce my co-moderator, Dan Seed. Thanks, Faith. Uh, my name is Dan Seed. I'm a lecturer at Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas, and uh, I used to work in television news and teach visual storytelling, media management, and television news. And uh, the rest of our colleagues here who are our panelists today, as we talk about the disruption of news and education, starting with um, Marion from Ryerson University. Hi, I'm Marion Kumi. Um, I'm with Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada, and I teach an international media production course where we uh, work with uh, students all around the world, as we do also with the Global News Relay that we're talking about today. And um, I spent many years with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in uh, television and radio news. Hi, I'm Jenny Lam. I'm with Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, I'm a lecturer in broadcast uh, journalism and investigative journalism. Uh, before I started teaching, I was in broadcast news myself. And I'll go. Sorry. Oops. Oh. April from um, Rita. Hi, I'm April de Haas. I am in Breda, the Netherlands. I uh, teach at uh, Breda University of Applied Sciences, but I'm actually Canadian from Toronto um, and have been here for about a decade. And uh, I teach uh, television production. So I join um, projects like Global News Relay, Marion's Global Campus Studio. Um, and I also teach uh, documentary producing, international producing, um, and before teaching, I worked for many years on uh, live studio productions for MTV, Nickelodeon, um, and um, corporations. And uh, Sally? Um, hello, I'm Sally, and I'm from the University of the West of England in Bristol, UK. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in journalism. I teach mainly um, media law and ethics at the moment. And um, in a past life, I worked in television news for Reuters Television, Associated, associated press, television news, and Kelly? Hi, I'm Kelly Coughlin. I work with Dan Seed at Texas State University. I was a journalist in all different platforms, print, mostly in television. Uh, was, I teach multimedia journalism, data journalism, and I teach very much now with smartphones. I taught a course that I created called Storytelling by Smartphone. Using cell phones for video and multimedia production is now a central part of all the courses I teach. Fred? Hi, I'm Fred Mudai. I'm course director of um, MA Global Journalism and Public Relations, and I've been working at Coventry University since 2004. Uh, before joining um, Coventry University, I did uh, my studies at Nottingham Trent University and Leeds University, but before that, I was working as a journalist with the Standard Media Group in um, Nairobi, Kenya, and I also had a stint, a stint with the Voice of America. Thanks. Hi, Dev. Hey, uh, I'm Dave. I'm the Information College of Journalism in Chennai. And uh, I teach uh, new media, which includes um, uh, the intersection of technology and storytelling. And uh, what I mean by that, it includes uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, drone journalism, and we are into uh, bots, chatbots. Uh, then um, uh, we, uh, as part of a module, you know, we work with a lot of universities around the world, and this is one of the programs. And uh, Faith and I have been working together for a lot of other collaborations, which uh, we hope uh, to include you guys as well in the next uh, iterations. which is called Pop-Up Newsroom. Uh, then, um, yeah, uh, then here, uh, good to actually have you around here. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, hello, Andrew Lindsay, um, TV and uh, print background mainly and a lot of radio too. So I worked for ITV here in the UK for about eight years and BBC since 2012. I still work for them uh, mainly on world service and uh, world news TV, uh, but mainly for the University of Salford, whom I'm representing today. So I've been there about six years. Thanks, and right up the road from uh... Kelly and myself is Bruce Geetson at Baylor University. Bruce, how are you? I'm good. Sorry, I just joined in here late, but glad to be a part of this. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, 
I'm the director of student media here at, uh, at Baylor. I oversee all the student uh, media and publications, including uh, this growing broadcast uh, group that we had. So this was quite an exercise doing this this year and I uh, appreciate, appreciate y'all support and just finished uh, meeting with our uh, executive producer about some of the challenges and face and um, I was uh, very happy as a great learning experience for them. Thanks, Bruce. All right. Well, as you know, we um, have all been having something in common, and that is that in one way or another, we've been sheltering in place, or maybe we've been in quarantine or isolation. Uh, it's happened at different times around the world. And depending on where you live, you are uh, experiencing it in a different way, but definitely we all have similarities. I'm going to start with Jenny. And Jenny, you, I think probably out of all of us, experienced COVID-19 um, first with uh, the university, uh, the Hong Kong Baptist University, mm -hmm. uh, basically virtually, I mean, real, really, literally being shut down. Um, as you were trying to organize the Global News Relay, which you did do while <laughs> sheltering in place, talk to us a little bit about that. So yeah, um, we, we were initially going to do a Global News Relay back in March, if you remember. Um, we had been, uh, we were kicked off our campus basically uh, last week of January. So it was Chinese New Year. We couldn't go back after Chinese New Year holiday, which was the beginning of February. Um, and I really, at that point, lost confidence in, in you know, getting everybody together for Global News Relay. Um, and, but, but during that time we went online, um, and by the way, uh, here in Hong Kong, we were also off our campus for half of the previous semester because of the protests here. So we had already been teaching, um, on Zoom. Um, but this semester we were able to, I, I had to come up with ways to teach an advanced broadcast class, how to do uh, a newscast without the studio, how to get everybody to pitch. And the main thing with Global News Relay and my classes where the students were unable to go out and film footage for their stories. So um, I, I basically, you know, had, had to say to them, just find whatever you are, you can online, you know, the purpose of your learning is to use footage to tell stories. Um, too bad if you can't actually go and film them. Um, are you going to share the video? Yes, actually, right this moment, I am trying to get that um, audio to work as I share it. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play it and mm -hmm. you can talk about it, okay? Because the audio is not right. going to work. So stand by just one moment and we will do that. So what, what Faith hopefully will bring up was, um, it was actually a, a news anchoring class that, in which the students were supposed to learn how to use a chroma key to present a local election. So we couldn't do any of that. We, we, we you know, uh, the university didn't want us to, to put the students in harm's way. So we, we set up this chroma key and this was just um, using Google Earth Studio and Prezi, a, a combination of the two. So this, what you're looking at right now, he's, he, he made the, a Prezi, and then he, he stuck it onto a chroma key uh, and, and a combination of also uh, Adobe After Effects. And this was a chroma key set up in my daughter's room. And there they are. Well, um, it, it wasn't the best of chroma key, obviously, because of the lack of depth in the room, but we didn't have another room. <laughs> um, this was the students um, doing a newscast on Zoom. Uh, this was a, the beginning. So... So the, the footage is uh, all filmed with um, cameras, and then we just got better, and we just became more confident. So we started making a, a, a trailer, and this was one of my students later in the, mes in, in the semester. So over, I mean, we have a 13-week semester. We just learned more and more and became more and more confident doing this stuff. Yeah. So, and, and I'll jump in here. So, so in terms of your end, Jenny, once once you got past the the initial shutdown, and then, you know, modifying how you go about doing this, what challenges did did 
you all face um, coordinating the global news relay and, and dealing with just everybody kind of getting hit by this um, as it unfolded throughout the spring? Um, I think that the communicant, and then that's everybody when we were having a good time. I just needed to put that in. <laughs> um, I think the, the communication got a little bit confusing. So here in Asia, we use WhatsApp a lot. Uh, so, so me and my students um, prefer to use that. And then we found that, oh, other people don't use that or, or they're unfamiliar with how this platform works. And some people prefer email. And so that, that part was a, a little bit tricky. Um, but, you know, we, we got it together. <laughs> yeah, the, Zoom, the Zoom was a, a, using the Zoom was, that was a, a, a learning curve for everybody as well. At one point, um, I had to call my uh, IT people at the university and say, hey, how do I stream it to Facebook? And they were like, I don't know. <laughs> we have never done it either. So we, we figured it out. Uh, and then we had, a, we had a lot of fun with the virtual set. Some of my students had Hogwarts as, uh, as a virtual set. Um, I had, I don't know if you've seen the movie Parasite. I had that. This, this is a real, this is real. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think I also teach a, a, an investigative journalism class. That class was much easier than the broadcast class because that mainly involved a lot of uh, search tools on the computer. So it was just a case of sharing my screen with them. But with broadcasting, it, it, was, it was tricky. And I think that I felt bad that the students, you know, they came to our university looking forward to that experience of using the studio. Um, and, and they didn't get it, really. I mean, how does everybody feel about that? Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, let's, let's open that up because Jenny's challenges that, that she mentioned, I think are ones that we, we all share. So um, who wants to jump in and discuss some of the production challenges that you all had um, in, in completing the Global News Relay? Uh, can I just uh, jump in uh, very briefly? In the case of Coventry University, we had uh, fortunately um, advised the students to do their stories uh, sooner rather than later. As, um, as soon as we started hearing of reports of COVID-19 virus in China, uh, we, and we, we, we heard about the change of the submission dates and the uh, transmission date, we said, we are not going to wait until close to the deadline. So can we get this done and dusted? We had initially uh, scheduled our uh, studio recording on the 2nd of March, and we said we are going to go ahead with that. And we did go ahead with that, and we had our recording in the studio on the, on the 2nd of March. So, but we had some issues with the, um, you know, we needed to check some uh, uh, consent issues as well as do some uh, fine tuning. So we were in a bit of a, a better position uh, but still, our students were uh, rather confused because of the constant changes. But as far as the actual packaging of GNR, we were in a better position. And let me just bounce to Sally, then I'll get to Marion and Kelly. Um, Sally, you had it, you finished early as well, but yeah. encountered a completely different issue, one that probably most of us have never really thought of. Yes, we for once we were early and we had it beautifully cut together. We went ahead and shot all the studio links and the edit was virtually finished. And then we shut down so quickly that we didn't get it off the server. And then it was locked, <laughs> locked in. So we had to kind of reconstruct the whole piece. Luckily, piece, people had their packages saved elsewhere so we could bring those together. And then we reshot the links, as you'll see when the GNR goes out in somebody's bedroom, um, having updated the script and then put in some of our new lockdown um, uh, pieces so it was it was a it was a really fantastic effort by the students to kind of think creatively about how we can reconstruct this in the best way possible and it, I you know I think I think it looks good in the end but that that was something we had never thought of and it also is a lesson it always back up <laughs> yeah certainly uh, definitely a good practice going forward one that we at Texas State definitely hadn't thought of um, Marion we were halfway through our semester when the shutdown came. So the Global News Relay stories, they had done a first cut. And in the real world, I would have um, told them all the things that were wrong with them and made them go out and do more shooting. But then we were stuck at home. So they 
they are not of the quality that I would have expected or they would have expected. So they had to go online and find, so some of the, the stories about recycling and then are the images they're finding online copyright protected? Are they allowed to use them or not use them? That was kind of going on with it as well. And some of the interviews they did had audio problems in them, but they couldn't go back and reshoot them. In 2020 hindsight, I wished that I'd said to them, contact the person you interviewed and interview them on Zoom and use that instead, which I didn't. In, in April earlier, when we were discussing just kind of the confusion of the situation and the confusion of students, you were nodding pre, pretty vehemently there. Can yeah. you talk about that? I think part of uh, the reason why I'm so much in agreement is because we had actually uh, been working on three of these different initiatives, Global News Relay. There was another one called um, Earth Day, Global Earth Day Live and uh, based out of Leeds and Marion's um, Global uh, Studio Network. Um, so I had uh, 20 students all working on different projects and they were just falling apart one at a time. And I was scrambling, of course, to come up with um, you know, new projects or, and indeed like everyone else, they had things half shot. So there was a lot of confusion with students, which is why it's so satisfying to sit here now when actually two of the three projects came to fruition and indeed they weren't of the same quality, but we still delivered a show in these times, which is absolutely amazing. And it's a great uh, learning experience, right? That, that everybody's having to do this professionally and now students are, are being forced to do that in that same real world environment. Um, you know, let's shift a little bit here because part of the discussion is about this idea of online education. We're all in that same boat of moving online. We've all had these, uh, you know, these stories about challenges and moving online. Um, let's, let's discuss this disruption in education and, and give some of your um, initial challenges that you faced about going online with these production heavy classes and then how you all readjusted um, throughout the semester to, to have some takeaways going forward. And I'll, I'll open this up to anybody that just wants to jump in here. Kelly? Oh, Marion can go first. I don't mind. I was just going to say one of the sort of humorous but strange things I think happened for a lot of us is students who were not willing to turn their cameras on when they came <laughs> to the classes, um, mostly because they're in their pajamas in bed. And um, how you then, you don't know if your students are there or not there, listening or not listening. And I told them all in advance, do your hair, put your clothes on. I want to, I want to see you. I want, I want your participation and it's not so that was certainly an interesting challenge that you're, how do you get them engaged when you don't know if their camera's not on? Mm -hmm. Kelly? Marianne, we taught our classes in our pajamas, so I don't see what that was. <laughs> yeah. it was. It was validating for the students to see professionals using Zoom and quarantined at home. And some of my former students are now news anchors, news reporters, and they shared their perspective. I got lucky in a sense. We met with our students about GNR right before spring break. Then they went on spring break, second week in March. Then that got extended to two weeks. And then of course we shut down in that second week, so I never came back. But I think Dev does a lot of the same thing I do. I had spent the first six or seven weeks of my course teaching my students in a video production class. Dan does some similar things. How to do all of these projects on their cell phones and Tyler on their cell phones, including editing and publishing finished mm -hmm. videos. We went on spring break, they never came back. They didn't have access to cameras. I got lucky because my students just because of what I'd managed to show them before, were tuned up to finish the semester entirely on their phones. So we've gotten some pretty remarkable projects that way. Shockingly, I think that's gonna be a big part of the future of video production. Yeah, and, and that's um, that's a great point. And one I wanna get into, Fred, Fred did raise his hand though. So Fred, I wanna give you an opportunity to jump in here. Okay, okay. Um, I would just like to say that in our case at Coventry University, it happens that the university has had uh, policies in relation to use of um, online um, uh, teaching and, and, and online learning. So that made it a bit easier for us when we transitioned into online learning because um, straight away we were using Microsoft Office and we were able to have editorial meetings to discuss the, the footage and other aspects because we were also working on another um, project, uh, magazine project. So um, 
Uh, the challenge we, felt, we, we faced was that uh, not all students were turning up, probably just slightly over 50% of the students were turning up. We faced the same issue of some students not turning their cameras on, but for us, mm -hmm. it wasn't that, that necessary. The most useful aspect of this was when I sat down um, for an, a, a, a Teams meeting to about three hours of Teams meeting in one day, broken into two Teams meetings, where I was with the student editor and the technical, ed uh, I mean, our technician, and we did some of the final editing um, on Teams. We, would, we were able, he was able to share some of the, um, you know, the footage and the audio and somehow that um, uh, worked for us. Can I just just add that you know, in t regarding what Sally said earlier about footage, um, again, we tend to use Moodle uh, custom for our university, and the university came up with a policy of saving everything on Office 365, which which has about one terabyte storage for every user. So all our footage and packages were stored on Office 365, which means as soon as university closed without a notice, and all of us were able to access our, our Office 365 storage space. And we used that for teaching and sharing students' resources as well. I, I see in our, our chat here that, that um, April and Sally both chimed in that, that you had better attendance or stronger attendance during online. What what in terms of engagement, how did you engage students to, to maybe draw them out of the woodwork to get them to come into class online? I think sometimes it's easier you don't have to get on a bus. You can just roll out of bed and be in class, which is good. Also, I think a lot of students interact in those ways anyway. We use Collaborate um, for quite a lot of teaching here. I don't know if other people have used it where, um, again, I was giving lectures um, in which you, they could see and hear me, but I can't see or hear them during the lecture, but they can um, add comments. And so they were sort of asking questions about the lecturers we were going through. And then at the end, they we can then answer, we sort of captures all the um, engagement that they're thinking of. Normally in a lecture, they wouldn't be able to sort of ask a question right in the middle, but they can during it using this online tool. So it actually was a kind of more engaging experience for them, I think. And um, for news days, we've been doing a lot of, um, they've been running entirely virtually and, and a lot of, for some reason, we, you know, we've had 100% attendance and engagement on some of those days, which we wouldn't have <laughs> necessarily um, in normal times. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting bit of research going forward, I think, to see why, what, what is it about this kind of um, teaching that actually works better for some students. Um, and I don't know if you found, um, I was having a lot of one-to-one -one Zoom meetings with students. We would have our classes and I found there are a lot of the quieter students that yeah. I got to know a lot better because from my living room to their living room and they're not having to compete with any of the other students to talk. Sure. And then we would share the Google Drive if they were working on a script, we would work on the script together. So I found that very helpful. I have that same experience. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, April. Just, just quickly that the only thing about those one-on-one -on -one meetings and all of this collaboration, and it was just a complete frenzy at the beginning. And while attendance is better and we are able to teach a lot of what we do, the workload with those one-on-one -on -one meetings has me personally destroyed at the end of a day because my hours are doubled at least and I think the same goes for students because they have that kind of access at the same token it's still really satisfying because you are reaching those quieter students and you know you're delivering you know better more concise advice Bruce um thanks Kelly I, I, we were in the same boat that that you were Kelly at uh here at, in, in Waco and that the spring break got extended a week and then they said, no, we're not gonna allow students back on campus. And the students were kind of trying to figure out how are we gonna do our classes? And the professors were trying to figure out how to teach online because that wasn't the normal mode here. And so there was a week there after spring break, uh, we stopped doing our weekly newscasts that we tape on Friday mornings, but we still told, told the students, you still gotta produce content, content and populate our website digital with both print and, and broadcast. And so it took them about a week to get into that mode where they said, hey, we've got to do this. 
and they started producing some stories, but I had about 50% participation because some of them weren't quite sure. They, they liked the face-to-face -face interaction with people with stories and they were having a hard time adapting to that. And then we got a project kind of dumped on our plate early in, early in April and they gave us a week to produce some student election debates for the three top for student body president and internal and external vice presidents. And they came to our students and said, we'd like you guys to do that student government. And our students, well, that'll be fun. I said, well, wait a minute, let's plan this out. And in the back of our mind, the Global News Network was always lurking and they hadn't made a decision on that. So in a week they produced, uh, we, 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 and it was all done via Zoom, it was virtual, these student body debates. And then we had our weekly meeting right after that. And I said, hey, good job on that, guys. We've got to make a decision on Global News Relay. And this was around the middle of April. And, uh, and surprisingly, I thought they were going to say, well, it's just it's too much work. We're too tired. You guys had opened it up to COVID to do those stories, too. And they were more excited about that than the Earth Day. And they unanimously, I mean, I say unanimously, there's nine students in, in, in my broadcast lab. But they said, they unanimously, they said, yeah, we want to do GNR. I said, okay, we started going through the stories and the rundowns and how are you gonna do it? And then we put it on our managing editor and executive producer. How are you gonna piece that together with split screens and Premiere and all that? We weren't able to use a studio that we normally had. And so that was a real challenge for them as well. But I think one of the positives out of this is it opened eyes of the students that now you've got a new incremental interview stream or video stream. You've got people on this campus, sometimes we call, can we do interviews? And they'd get the deer in the headlights about having a TV camera in front of them. They're a lot more comfortable talking to a computer now because they're so used to having doing so much Zoom or, or WebEx or Teams or whatever it is that now I think it will be easier for students in the future to get these type of interviews and it'll be more accepted by journalists to say, hey, this is how we got the video and how we talked to them because you see the networks doing it all the time. So I think long term, it's going to be a big positive. Mm. We had a similar experience. In fact, some of our shy students who got deer in the headlights also preferred doing interviews. So I ended up doing some tutorials that I never intended to do starting in late March, which was here's how you can host a Zoom meeting. I sent tutorials with videos, showed them how to be a host, how to record certain tips in there. Then one of the problems we had was you couldn't shoot B-roll, right? So I teased early in the semester, there are different kinds of shots. One is the reversal or cutaway. You don't get paid enough for those shots. But then I said, guess what? You've been promoted. Now that you can't go out and shoot B-roll, you do make enough for cutaways. And here's how you use your cell phone to shoot a cutaway of you doing an interview with Zoom so that you can edit around jump cuts. I showed them tools in Premiere that I never thought I'd have to show, like transitional tools. And then a great thing about Zoom for one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, and Marion alluded to this, the one-on-ones, and so did April. But I was able to have students share their screen, and it was just like I was looking over their shoulder with technology. They had a problem with Adobe Audition, Adobe Premiere. Here's how you fix that. Show me your screen and I'm going to talk you step by step through how to do it. So Zoom was actually a terrific tool in that sense. That was very much like a live lab. So yeah. Kelly, oh, sorry, so Jenny. Yeah, so so one of the problems that uh, we're, we're actually still having is um, uh, our senior students. They, they have to complete um, a, a graduation project. Um, I think that the, the problem with doing everything online is uh, two things. Uh, it, it depends a lot on the capacity of your computer. And secondly, um, the, 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 how well the student can handle technology. And that there's, there's a discrepancy, there's a you know, uh, difference. I have students who, are, who, who beg to go back to the campus to, to use the Premier because their own computer cannot handle the, all that uh, video footage. Um, the, another very uh, big problem uh, we have uh, here in Hong Kong is that uh, we, have, we have some students who are in mainland China and uh, they, they don't have, uh, they, they can use Zoom, but they cannot use Google. So we, we couldn't share a lot of the uh, uh, stuff that we have um, on our G drive with them. Um, uh, when we ask them to do certain things in the internet, they have to use a, a VPN, uh, which by the way is illegal can, and can get them into trouble. So 
that inequality was something that we had to uh, bear in mind. That's something that we had. Can I jump um, in? Yeah, Dev. Yeah, um, actually, this has been uh, the lockdown started a little late here in India because this has been quite an eye opener for a lot of a lot of us, particularly for me in the sense that uh, I do a lot of you know high end technical thing. You know, for example, I never thought I'd be able to teach uh, interactive virtual reality and augmented reality so, or uh, gamification, then uh, chat board. And these are very highly technical things. I never thought I'd be able to actually deal with the students on Zoom, uh, trying to teach them this. The learning curve is except drones. You can practically teach anything on Zoom. So what we used was a combination. Now we started with blue jeans. Then we were not comfortable with blue jeans. Then we used a combination of Zoom for face-to-face uh, -face meetings for um, you know, just uh, live meetings. Then along with that, you know, we used um, uh, um, the web platform called EC Class. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Google Classroom. This is pretty much like Google Classroom. Google Classroom is, of course, I would highly recommend Google Classroom. Um, yeah. Or a EC class along with Zoom. So you can keep assignment and people who are not comfortable with cameras, and a lot of people are not comfortable with cameras. They can actually get on with the one-on-one -on -one interaction, we'll have one-on-one -on -one interaction with them. With the with the professor on uh, in, in the by way of text, which are those other people don't get to see. Then uh, somebody else mentioned, you know, I found the attendance um, 100 percent for a change uh, when they are home. And I another experience, you know, another experience I would like to share with this. I want people who are usually very very, you know, just introvert type and the creativity that you know this this they, when they are in their own space when they are in, in their comfort zone. And uh, I a lot of them were very, very much more creative than in the classroom. So that is one of the, one of the eye opener for me. Then I can show you, you know, just, uh, can I share my screen? You know, something we did? Um, yeah, go for it, yep. Share my screen? Yes. So, yeah, for example, you know, so we uh, do something like, uh, so we do something say uh, interactive via news reporting, our uh, newscaster is in 360. So something like this, um, I never thought I'd be able to do this. Um, hold, hold, hold. Uh, okay. Dev, hold on yeah, one second. For example, I, I've something got, like I've, this. Only Dev, April yep. and Dan can share their screen. Yeah, I need Please. to. I need to get this um, set here. My apologies. Um, no worries. Uh, so we sent out people for reporting, and when they come back with the reports, and so and this is one of the things that we actually use with the the footage, leftover footage, what they had. Uh, into a 360. Can I can can you see my screen? No, right now we can't. Um, I'm trying to get it set. You can see that. Can no, you see no. my screen? Okay. Let me let me see if so I can this, do it. Again. Um, it says right now. Uh, let's see. What, try one more time, Devin. See if you can do it. It says that you should be able to. You may have to double click. Yeah, okay. Do you want me to go, come back? Okay, I'll do. Yeah. Try one more time. Can I do it again? Yes. Yeah. yeah, sure. Things are a little bit different when you are actually taking it live than when you practice. Like we have the, uh, there we go. There we go. Got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we have. Uh, I am uh, see this is the interactive 360 experience. This is, a, this is how we do newscast. So when you have say different people can experience this differently. So the user is in control and the user can actually this uh, it looks a little uh, odd. So when the user plays or hits it and watches it, and this is actually the interactive. You create in one 360 create a uh, interactive hotspots where this play express you. So by gazing at it, you don't click on it. You gaze on the uh, on the computer and it takes you the, to another 360. So one 360, and we have three reporters lined up in, inside that 360. You can see that? Okay, reporter and uh, on it, and that reporter starts reporting. And here you again the user is in control. You can go back to the express avenue again by looking at that uh, that that button, or you can the user can go back to the home home screen. That's very, very cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, one thing that that has been uh, brought up here as Dev was talking, which that was really interesting to see, 
um, in, in the use of VR and, and how you're able to use that during this time is this discussion. And I think this goes back to equity that Jenny brought up with students um, that we just assume you've got the internet. We just assume you've got a good computer. We just assume that you're going to be able to run programs like Avid or Adobe Premiere. Um, going forward, what what would you like to see happen? Maybe at your universities, or not to get too specific, but um, you know, going forward, maybe in general, um, to help students or or your programs shore up in case something like this happens again, so that students have access to computers that oh, no. are, you know able to run programs like Premiere uh, away from the university? Um, yeah, that's a hard one because, because when they're at school, um, they use, uh, you know, the, the Mac, you know, like a big Mac. Um, and obviously, uh, many of them cannot afford that at home. Uh, how, to, how to make it more equal? Uh, well, I mean, here in Hong Kong, I know some of the very wealthy private schools, I'm talking about high schools, they started giving the students or, uh, or lending them computers, but um, I'm not sure if uh, universities can do that. That, would have, that was gonna be my suggestion to um, allow students to borrow um, equipment to bring it home. Um, yeah. Is another another issue that comes up is the students all have their mobile phones, but in their home when they're back living with their parents, there may be one laptop at home. While well, mom and dad may both be working from home, younger brother and sister may both be having to do online learning from home. And then we're all saying to them, this is your class time and you have to be there. So I was having a lot of students using their mobile phones to attend their classes and then the quality wasn't necessarily as good um so you know those were issues that um everyone was having to deal with in canada and i'm sure where where you are as well mm. and it's Fred, also I saw, you, I saw you raised your hand yes um i mean and again fortunately um for coventry university our grad under for our gra undergraduate students um, they are provided with um, state-of-the-art um, Mac uh, laptop, um, wow. which is preloaded with um, Adobe Creative Suite and other mm -hmm. software when they join in the first year, which they have co-own with the university for the, for, the, for the three years of their study. And then it gets transferred to them at the end of their three years with no additional fee. Wow. Uh, so it is one of the facilities that universities provide. So different uh, departments uh, offer different facilities, but in the case of the School of Media and Performing Arts, which is where journalism and media production and other similar courses are based, it is the laptop, the um, uh, Apple Mac laptop that is, uh, that is offered. Uh, in the case of um, um, postgraduate students, uh, similar offer is not made but they are, um, if, if students come with their own personal laptop, the university uh, provides Adobe Creative Suite. We only, uh, and I teach a uh, postgraduate level, the master's degree, all students, uh, all of our students uh, didn't have an issue with um, uh, editing using uh, Premiere uh, Pro, but, uh, except one. So, you know, that's the kind of provision that uh, we provide. Very good. And then Kelly, you had your hand up. Brad, on that same topic, it's a great point, which we just encountered. So our department for summer, which starts our summer classes start first of June, we recognize that that was a problem just in the last few weeks. It emerged as a problem again that we hadn't thought of because they had access to state of the art computer labs on campus. Now they don't. And so all of a sudden they're running into the same problem at home. So we have arranged for students to have access to creative cloud software, but also we're getting dozens of new MacBook Pros that students, MacBook Airs, that students will be able to check out on an as needed basis starting in summer one. That's a brand new offering from our university because of this problem that we hadn't anticipated. So you were ahead of the curve, that was smart. And I know that we've talked about a lot of the resources that we have for students at universities that have resources, but what about those universities that don't have resources? 
Um, I was mentioning in, in the project that I work on called the Global Campus Studio Live, one of our partners is Johannesburg in South Africa. Many of the students from there, when the university shut down, they live in more rural areas. Uh, they don't have laptops at home and there's no Wi-Fi. The data costs are really high. So the show that we did with them, they landed up having to sort of put it together on their own in bits and pieces and they were just sort of assembling it. <clears throat> However, if any student was able to assemble their part and then put them together. So we weren't able to do it live or even live to tape um, because they, their students simply didn't have access to, um, to Wi-Fi and, um, and they didn't have access to computers. Uh, and also, I think, um, April, you mentioned something about Adobe Creative Suite. Oh, yeah. At, uh, very early into the crisis, we got word that they were making it completely free to all students. But then again, it's do they have um, a laptop that can handle that? And I just wanted to, on the back of Marion, quickly say that um, I now have students coming to me because we've wrapped our semester. Um, we are now entering a new semester. They're actually coming and pitching me what we should do in the next semester with lack of equipment and lack of laptops. And I've received three or four different ideas because I was actually, we were going to be launching a new show and I've approached some of you to kind of help take part in that. Um, but just kind of like a, a, a Breda Today type news show. Um, so they're coming and pitching me how they can use the technology. So they're already innovating and thinking how they can do it. So they're making my job easier. Something that I've noticed about the students, and this is, I'm sure, in addition to Fresno State, is that they have been extremely innovative and they really haven't wanted to give up. I, um, I do have a video that I wanted to show you that it's just a very, very brief little video um, of what some of the things that they did starting with, and I'm gonna see if I can make this work with a little bit of sound too. I'm Nadia Gonzalez. Hello. And I'm Hector Mendoza. We're in a sort of Super Tuesday hangover. Even though the numbers speak to a win for Dyer, he's not yet made a formal announcement. Tomorrow, we're going to be at a high 82, and then that's going to be our hottest temperature this week. Live from the Save Mart Center, Zion Goodman, Fresno State Focus. Here we go again. There we go. There's three. Where's Melissa? I'm working on it. Uh, sorry. I don't know if I can do four. <laughs> oh, you can. You can me out of there. Yeah. <laughs> wow, go team. Something I learned, uh, I feel like we all learn um, from COVID is that use all the resources available, whether it's YouTube, whether it's social media, or, or anything out there. You just gotta ask and you just gotta tell yourself, oh, maybe I could use this for my story. This has made me a bigger person, so I've learned a lot. I told myself to to make a schedule to to continue um, learning, because only because the this disease is going on, that doesn't mean that I have to stop uh, stop learning. We ended up doing nine newscasts in total. Three of them were in the studio, six were in their bedrooms, and um, basically they just learned how to make things work. I don't know if you did hear what Gia was saying. He learned how to be resourceful, and that's not something our students typically learn during a normal school year. Yeah, I agree. I, I think everyone learned so much how to adapt, and then because they were also seeing in the professional news, them all adapting in the same way and seeing how everyone out there in the regular broadcast world was doing it. And you know, also some of the things that they are so good at with TikTok and Instagram, I found my students adapted very quickly to saying, oh, I can take my mobile phone out and I can do a selfie video and uh, you know, do stand up reports and live locations. They went out on the streets and got all kinds of shots of empty, empty streets and closed businesses and closed restaurants. And so, yeah, those skills they really adapted to. And also then um, for my students who don't watch television, it was a way for them to also learn um, how accessible news is on the good old fashioned television that their parents watch 
and now they're using their modern skills and they're watching. Uh, this is a um, video of when we're in our studio. So this is the Global Campus Studio. And you can see this is one we did with Fresno and Brazil and um, London and Scotland and some of the other countries that we work with. So we're normally in our studio with um, using Skype for broadcast. This is our Studio B control room. And then I don't know if the screen grab is there. And there we were doing Global um, Campus Studio Live. The show was called The New Normal. These are face two hosts at the bottom there. So this was one show we did with Just Toronto. And uh, there are the students from uh, Jenny's Hong Kong students. And we had Tel Aviv and Russia. And um, so all over the world. And it was, um, in many ways, it was more seamless. I don't know, April and Jenny and Faith, who are all part of it, if you agree. It was relatively seamless and uh, we but we didn't do it live so we made the decision as opposed to going live we recorded it and i had a student editor and after the shows were over he edited in the lower thirds and he edited in all kinds of graphics and b-roll and um and then um it took a long time to export because he was using his home laptop but um Within about four or five days of shooting the shows, we turned them all around and sent them out on Facebook and YouTube. It was a great experience. Yes. I was going to the say class. that too. It used to be so important to us to have everything live. And then once COVID hit, post-production was, was our friend. Everything was done in post. We, just, we really did not find a um, adequate streaming service or adequate platform to actually go live. And I know Marion, my engineers, Terry Dolph and um, Eli, they worked with your engineers at Ryerson University to try to figure out one platform that we could use to make it all happen. And we just haven't been able to do that yet. We worked on something called Studio 10, uh, which is a virtual uh, control room. But the problem, even when we did a test case with uh, several locations within Toronto, the audio and video quality was not as good as Zoom. Mm -hmm. And it allowed you to do a lot more things that you could do in a real control room. Um, but we made the decision to go with Zoom because he couldn't get the quality control he needed from that particular platform. Yeah. I would suggest be live. You know, we've been doing this uh, from different countries, you know, say eight uh, to 12 countries for the last five years using a technology called be live TV. And uh, you can bring in the lower third and the entire PCR. And the page has been part of this um, for the last two, three years. And uh, we have this uh, like pop up newsroom. You know, we just uh, like this global newsroom. You know, we just go live. Uh, so we do that three, uh, three, three times in a year. And the last one was the International Women's Day on um, March 8th. And you know, we went live from with women's activists from 17 different countries, including Afghanistan, people's like in Afghanistan, and where we talk about internet connectivity, and but we managed to pull it off. And another thing I would like to bring about this, um, the you know, the like I texted in the chat, uh, what we find in India is the mobile technology is a great leveler. You don't need to have a, a fancy Mac to be able to produce a broadcast quality product. Uh, for example, you know, like I said, the chroma, yeah, the chroma key thing can easily be done like this on um, Kinemaster. And it can be taught on Zoom. And you're going to have, uh, so uh, what I mean, to, uh, what I say, the quality people talk about the, when you talk about, uh, the, when you're talking about mobile technology, talk about the broadcast quality. So for example, you know, the last time I touched a broadcast camera was 18 years ago. So if you give that camera to me, you know, it would be horrible. So don't blame the camera for that, blame me for that. So if somebody is not able to produce a, a broadcast quality product with the phone, that, that person doesn't know how to use it. That's my point. Okay, like giving me a broadcast camera and asking and expecting a high quality broadcast quality product, which Dev, I don't, yeah. I, I'm not Dev, comfortable doing that. Dev, we have a couple of- So I of think mobile technology has a level the playing around, playing field. Dave, Dave, we have a couple of questions for you. Kelly has asked sure. if you please share the name of the online tool that you use and also the name of the app that you use for going live. Yeah, going live, you know, be live TV, be, be live TV. Uh, which uh, you get a 14 day free version. So Faith, you're more familiar with because we've done it for four or five and you can actually bring in pre-packaged live as well as pre-packaged product, uh, pre-packaged uh, uh, bits into that. So if you watch, I can share the link with you sometime later, later that is, and if you watch the we went line for eight, uh, nine universities and uh, Coventry, uh, yeah, Coventry was part of it. Priya was, Priya was my colleague, by the way, Fred. 
and yeah. um, yeah, Coventry was part of it. And what we did was, you, know, uh, you can actually we used uh, Google Earth to actually take one, the audience from one university to another. And also, after ECG is done, our college is done, we shifted the studio to Coventry seamlessly. And the whole prediction was done from Chennai. And from Coventry, it was shifted to Germany. And from there to Fresno. And I still remember it was 3 o'clock in the morning and Fresno students were up and were doing something. It was live reporting in real time and three hour show. And it was Using 3 o'clock in the morning. Seamless integration. <laughs> yeah. Seamless, seamless yeah. with no heavy investment. And uh, yeah, you can just look it up, uh, you know, pop up newsroom. And that is Be Live TV, okay, which can be produced in a, with a, a laptop and you can have Go With Third, you can have Ricky. And the most important thing about it is the real time interactive, interactive feature. That is if, um, okay, uh, if somebody is watching in Mexico City and, uh, you're, you're, uh, and if that person, she has a question, the audience, real time interacting, interaction with the audience. If that person has a question, they can actually uh, type the question on the Facebook on the Facebook comment and type the question and we get to see that. The producer gets to see that and producer can pin that question onto the screen and ask the reporter or the guests. Excellent. Okay, and uh, this is amazing, that technology, I don't know why this is not being used. Um, I mean, only I think um, only we've been using this. Let's just try that out, uh, be live. Coventry has been part of it, the Fresno has been part of it. Uh, Hong Kong, I don't know whether Hong Kong has been part of it. And that is one level up. Okay, this is a free technology. You don't need a satellite, OB WAN. You don't need any satellite connectivity, and it's in real time. That reporting that changes everything. The real time nature and the real time interaction with the audience, the engagement with the audience. I mean, that's what I find very interesting. And the other technology for editing, you know, that's uh, KineMaster is amazing. Say that for again. Android and KineMaster. I just a uh, K KineMaster. It's a German thing. K I N E. I'll put in the chat there. Okay, all right. Master. Excellent. And we're, that's what I used to teach the chroma, chroma key. So you can you see just in a few seconds, you can change the chroma key with KineMaster. Uh, then for Luma Fusion, that's what we use in ACJ, you know, for uh, editing. So that, uh, because uh, it's very difficult to get Mac for uh, students and we have got only very few Macs, but uh, we encourage people to just go out and, and be on the phone and uh, test stuff. Because this, like, like we are using, and I'm not using a laptop here, I'm, I'm just going, I'm participating in this on my iPad. No, I don't use a laptop anymore. Uh, so this is more comfortable for me. It's actually, when you're traveling also, you can actually use this. Um, so, like I said, except drone, you can do pretty much everything on, uh, with the Zoom and the combination of Zoom plus uh, Google Classroom or um, EC Class. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, so what we've been talking about, as uh, for those of you who are joining us, by the way, we are streaming live on YouTube and also um, it's been connected to Facebook. We did have, uh, just so our panelists all know, we did have a bad um, Zoom, uh, I'm sorry, a bad YouTube link up there originally. So if you are trying to watch this um, or have your colleagues or students watch this, you may wanna take a moment to send out the um, correct link which I think I have put in the chat there for you so you can send that out. Also, um, I wanted to, we've been talking about disruption in the industry. We've talked about technology. We've talked about the types of stories that our students have done. Um, we also need to talk a little bit about the evolution of the journalists. So we are people now sitting in our bedrooms and in our living rooms, or some of my students are doing their um, stories from inside their cars because they have too many children in their families and don't have any private space to work in. But what about the evolution of the journalists? Were people now showing our emotions? Is that good or is that bad? Kelly. Well, I think that's good. I think there's something authentic about it. And a lot of the, again, I've had former students who do this as anchors. They've set up a whole studio at home, but then they'll show you the studio. A really robust part of actual professional reporting and GNR has kind of embraced this for a few years. We've done it for years in our class but social media. So you get that look behind the scenes at sort of the home studio. But the other thing is uh, some difficulty doing live shots. We still do live coverage via social media. So my students now use Facebook to do Facebook Live or Instagram videos, or they'll share videos on Twitter. And that's a very important part of it is you'll do live coverage. You'll put us at the scene on social media. Maybe later it's appropriate then to take that video from your social media or your phone and incorporate it in your story but if it's not, that's your live 
presence. And that's another really important change. And a number, again, of my former students who are now employees in newsrooms have said that using phones and social media has become a much more robust part of their reporting. Absolutely. And Jenny, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I think the, the part that's really missing is I, I personally believe that a huge part of education um, is for these young people to learn how to work with um, people in the real world. Uh, yes, uh, obviously many of them are, are technically very capable, uh, but, but is working in a real people environment when they leave university um, that's we, what we need to offer them. Absolutely. And I know that there are a few people who we have not been able to hear from <clears throat> too much. Um, Bruce, it, it looks like you have something to say. I did. I, I think uh, one of the interesting things after GNR was talking to the students about how they came up uh, with how they improvised to shoot their stories, They're using Amazon boxes to make a tripod. Mm -hmm. You know, or getting their mom to help them with lighting. And then the mom was saying, quiet on the set, you know, those kind of things. And so, and that's a big part once they get into the professional environment of having to improvise and make do with what they have. And I think that's one of the valuable lessons from this GNR, from this whole COVID situation, is they got to figure out ways that they maybe not have, have thought of before to do it. And then also that that, like you talked about, Jenny, is more accepted now than it used to be. Used to be real journalists or, or commercial or network journalists would scoff at doing a phone interview or something like that. Well, now it's more accepted to do because of the restraints we've had on this. And I, I think that was fascinating talking to my students about how they made things work without a lot of equipment or whatever. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Andrew. Yeah, I was just going to say I agree with that. And I think it's been a bit of a leveler for them because the the issue we've had for years is that, you know. We started off in journalism, most of us who were lecturing it in a completely different world where there was just no virtual interaction at all. And so getting hold of people in person, knocking on doors was all part of our lives. They're really uncomfortable with that in the main, the younger students, mine anyway, I've found for years. And so this has been a kind of halfway house of asking people and experts who suddenly have actual time to speak to my students. They can do video calls with them and it kind of it seems to be a leveler i just think that you asked at the beginning about emotion i don't know if we did you ask about journalists showing emotion and that's the only thing i'm worried about that we there's a little bit of a danger of journalists becoming the story a little bit you know there's a kind of look at meism that seems to be reasonably prevalent because there's all this airtime to fill and no pictures so that's the bit that concerns me yeah and of course there's that difference then between journalism and opinion, which I think, in, at least in the United States, we have a difficult time telling the difference between the two. And that brings us to media literacy, too, and verification. When we have, especially our students who don't have as much experience deciding what the uh, news source is that they're using and whether it's real news or that other word, <laughs> fake news, um, how do we make sure that our students are learning how to properly verify the information that they're getting? Who wants so, to take Jenny? so I, I teach um, an investigative journalism class, and I actually spend two of those classes just uh, on fact checking and verification. And it's it's all kinds of tools. And but the really frustrating part is um, as soon as somebody comes up with a verification tool, um, then the people making the fakes will come up with something to override it. Um, so it's, I think this is a, a, a constant battle for, for journalists. Yes. Which, which I think is very frustrating. I mean, I, I'm sure that, that all of you remember a time when the, the work of the journalists was to go to find the stories rather than deciphering the truth from the fakes, right? And now they are deciding, and they're deciding what the stories are. They're deciphering truth from fake. And they're also trying to be on first with their Facebook lives or their um, social media. Dan, what did you have to say about that? Yeah, it's just interesting, this idea of fakes and deep fakes and, and believing what you see. Uh, there's a, a documentary airing currently on ESPN here on um, Michael Jordan and his Chicago Bulls final team. And there's an ad 
that plays um, during one of the commercial breaks where it's two sports center anchors. It's a real sports center shot from the 1990s. So you feel like it's a part of the documentary and then they've deep faked the anchor to where now he's talking about, you know, and in 30 years, they're going to make a documentary about this, about this Chicago Bulls team, and you're going to watch it and you're going to do this and da, 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 da. And it's actually an advertisement, um, which really felt dirty when I watched it. Cause I, I'm watching the documentary. I'm thinking, Oh, great. An old sports center clip. And then all of a sudden it's an advertisement where they've manipulated the anchor's mouths and voices to, to feel like it's part of the show. Um, and to me, that's incredibly frightening when you see that from a network, right? Like ESPN, um, allowing that to happen during a show to where they're creating this seamless transition between an advertisement and, and, and the show. And there's no disclaimer, you know, no commercial break or any black screen. It just goes right to it. Um, you feel like you're watching the documentary and that's, that's really dangerous um for for you know students i think and for people that are non-media literate to see that uh, that they're not able to really differentiate you know what they're seeing and the fact that a network would do that is is kind of that makes me a little nervous dan yeah. how do you feel about how do you feel about michael jordan having censorship rights on that program well and that's a whole nother discussion right is that they're creating this content and michael jordan is his production company is uh heavily involved and yeah, it, it, it makes you wonder what story we're getting. And we've seen some blowback from that just based off the last few episodes where some of the people that he's called out have um, come back and said, well, that's not exactly the whole story. So yeah, that's a, that's a different, that's a different time altogether, but yeah, no, it's, it, that's another really good discussion to have. I wanna um, hold up for just a second here because we are actually getting quite a few questions from people who are viewing us on YouTube right now. One is coming from Garima at Asian College of Journalism, who asks, do you think there will be enough job opportunities in the journalism fraternity or industry right after the pandemic ends? Who wants to take that one? We're all shaking our heads like we don't want to touch that one. But I think it's important that we address it. Uh, Deb, if you were trying to talk, you need to unmute. And in, in some way, oh. um, in some way I feel like there are more opportunities because there are more platforms. And so there, there may not be the sort of opportunities to be the reporter at the TV, the, the bricks and mortar TV station that there used to be. But I think our students are discovering all kinds of other ways to get their voices out there. Now, whether they can make money using those other ways of getting their voices out there is a, another question. But I think a, a lot of my students are feeling very positive about their ability to market themselves as an information producing product. Sally, what are your thoughts? I was just thinking that, you know, some of us, I think we're quite hopeful as well, in a way, because some of our students have already started little startups since we've been locking down, especially the third years are about to finish. And they're a bit kind of, well, the placements have disappeared, but what they're doing now is setting up their own places to um, produce work. Again, whether they can make a living out of it is, a, is another matter. But I also think that they are storytellers, what we produce. And so there are lots and lots of jobs out there for people who can make this kind of content especially as we're going online, think more, we'll need more content because we'll be doing more stuff online and our students are kind of quite nicely placed to be able to produce that. They're, they're, they're skills in editing and storytelling and, and producing nice content, I think might be a premium. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. And in several different industries, Fred, Thank you. Um, I think uh, what I would like to add to what has already been said is the fact that when we, we take with this kind of question, we tend to also bring in industry players who and those who have come to speak to our students at, at Coventry University, what they've tended to say is that they want people who have new skills. We tend to bring older editors and they say, if you can do something differently from the way we do it, from the, from the way we know it, if you can bring new skills, then they are always jobs. Um, so that's what one of our, uh, the senior editors we keep bringing in has said. 
Uh, if I can just go back to that issue of the, um, the current environment, what I've heard from my students is that they had a lot of difficulty getting hold of people to, to interview virtually. Um, and, and they were frustrated because they were still working on their portfolio and they were mainly not being, uh, peop sources were not cooperative very much. Um, in pre pre preparation for this meeting, I spoke to one of the officials of the Kenya Correspondent Association. And, and what he was telling me is that, well, there are no opportunities to speak to sources at meetings, at conferences, at events, which gives them the opportunity to speak to sources. So basically, sources who do not want to speak to you are very difficult to hold of, to get hold of. And he, he uses the term that uh, the fact that the sources, sources are actually hiding. My final point is, um, on, on this particular, on some of the things that have already been said is that I think the kind of experience our students have had now, particularly the kind of uncertainty that was co going on around the time of or where they don't know what's happening, we update them and things change the same day. That's the kind of environment that prepare, prepares them very effectively for the industry environment. Yes, and I think I've heard the same thing from our students as well, that they feel much more prepared. Kelly, I will go to you in just a moment. Yeah, uh, I'd like to actually pick up from where uh, Fred left off. In, uh, in, ACG, what, uh, in ACG, what we have done from what we are trying to do from this year is you know, we have just scrapped the streams. We don't have broadcast, you know, we used to have broadcast journalism, print journalism, and radio journalism. Now, from this semester, this, this term onwards is just integrated journalism. Mm -hmm. So what we are just essentially doing is uh, we are just trying to actually uh, cope with the industry, the challenges we are going to face in the industry. Like Fred has been telling, you know, the industry is looking for new skill set. So, for example, you know, suddenly the uh, COVID and uh, this whole pandemic thing is, is suddenly uh, made people aware of the, the importance of data journalism. Data journalism used to be a specialist area. Now, everybody has to understand data. Okay, what is doing and health journalism, health reporting. Suddenly, this has become a uh, very uh, you know just to look at look at how how health reporters are doing. So suddenly, what, what we have done, what we have decided in ACJ is uh, we just integrated the whole program so that uh, our students, you know, after the ten months training. Oh, by the way, you know, ours is not an MA program; it's a very very hectically packed ten months program. It's a postgraduate diploma program. So once they are out of their industry ready, in the sense that. They can go, those who want to go to broadcast, they will have the skill set. Those who want to do data skills, they will have the health skill set. And those who want to do interactive multimedia, they will have the health set. And podcasting is also a huge part of it. So that's what we integrated the whole program into one stream, which is integrated journalism. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, I've been just arguing for this for a long, long time. And I don't understand because the way we, we all evolved and I came from print. Back in the 80s, we were in print, then we just evolved to another because I was just uh, crazy enough to get into mobile journalism way back in 1998 when we were actually breaking stories by text messages, SMS. And who thought, you know, just if, um, what somebody would be able to send an email on a phone? Nobody. People would have laughed at you. I'm talking about 1998. Okay, yeah. We were breaking stories in the form of SMS. Then suddenly, you know, there was a leap in quantum leap in technology so far as we were concerned. That was MMS. We were super thrilled with MMS. Now, aha, you can actually add an image to your stories. So that's where we started. In it. So this is the evolution, this is evolving. So I'm not saying, so what you are completely agree with this, and there are going to be more job opportunities actually. Because industry is looking for people, like somebody texted that, you know, okay, so I'm saying, I'm getting paid $100,000, 100,000 pounds. So what if the industry, uh, somebody can hire 10 people with that kind of money, uh, sorry, five people with that kind of money and bring in more skill set. And industry, if I'm a publisher, I would definitely go for that. So actually, this is this I see an opportunity in this challenge. Okay, I so many things we could con con continue for probably another four hours, but I'm going to go to Kelly to um, he has another point to make, and then we'll talk with Marion. I'll be brief. First, Deb, you're having me flash back to my BlackBerry, so thank you for that. But <laughs> the we have a bit of a different model, so we didn't do integrated journalism. We still have sort of specialties, but. Uh, in our journalism, we still have students who primarily emphasize uh, print or multimedia photography, but we merge that together. And so our students in journalism, our students in broadcast are all heavily steeped in digital because digital has cut across our curriculum. So our public relations students take uh, advanced social media and analytics course. And what we find is we get students who graduate uh, and work in local newspapers. I just had a few get hired in local newspapers. We have students, a number of students working in traditional television newsrooms, 
But we also have students with these digital media skills, multimedia storytelling skills, savvy with photography, working with cell phones on video, social media analytics, not just best practices, but analytics reports. We have students working at Google, Facebook, for Gannett's corporation, so that they're doing work that serves a number of newspapers. So we very often find students take these skills and take multimedia storytelling skills and wind up in unusual situations. Have one student who was a former public relations major, works for a luxury hotel in Dallas. They came to a meeting one day and said, gosh, it'd be great if we could produce videos for our conference attendees coming in and welcoming them. I wish we could do that. And one of my students said, we can do that with our phones. She sort of became a television star in that hotel during conferences since then because of the skills she learned in our program. Fantastic, Marion. Yeah, I was gonna add to that. Um, I don't know if all of you are journalism programs. Mine is not a journalism program. Mine is a media production program. So a lot of my, some of my students become journalists, but many others are into all other aspects of media production. And they have long lived in a world of short contracts, partial contracts, they're working on Big Brother Canada for six weeks, and then they're working on another show for two months, that kind of thing. But what you were just saying, Kelly, um, is a really positive thing that's happening to my students. The corporate world loves their skills. So um, I'm in charge of the fourth year, or Americans call them seniors, or we call them fourth years, um, and they do an internship. And one of, the, one of my students, I'm reading her essay and she's working for a garage door company. And I was like, what? And because they wanted to do branding. They wanted a social media presence. They wanted marketing. They wanted videos. So, so many of my students are getting jobs with their skills that they have um, doing like so much social media and um, corporate videos and their ability to shoot and edit and write these kind of videos is, um, and those are things they can make money at. It's precarious labor because it's temporary sometimes, but um, they're getting lots of work. Yes, I agree. And um, the point that you're making about corporate jobs as a result of broadcast journalism or multimedia jobs is important because that's where a lot of our students are going. Bruce. Oops. Just, 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 to, just to add a little bit to uh, what Marion and Kelly were saying, um, I think the stereotype of the old journalist is diminishing and going away. And I think the, but the ability to write and communicate are still uh, the foundation that'll help you get a job. I've got some friends who manage some McDonald's restaurants and was talking with them recently and they said, when they're taking, they said, what do you teach at Baylor? I said, well, one of the things is writing and they rolled their eyes. I said, why do you say that? And they said, well, if I get applications for employment and if I get an application that has two sentences that are grammatically correct and linked together for one complete thought, I immediately put that application in a management trainee <laughs> position. The art of writing is becoming a lost art and communicating. And if you talk to news directors at TV stations, and Kelly, you may uh, agree, hopefully will agree with this, they'll say the fastest ways to get a job and then move up or as a, as, a, as a producer or someone who can write, and then also as somebody who can do something digitally. And that includes the videos that you're talking about and this help. You know, two of our grad, uh, students who graduated last year got jobs as producers in Waco, and they both just recently after one year made market jumps with new jobs, more than 75 market sizes. Definitely. Because they could produce and write. And I, so the jobs are there. You have to have those basic skills, but then if you can tweak it with some, some digital and video production and things like that, there's nothing wrong with a corporate job. And do you, I mean, some of them are freelance, but some of them, if you prove your worth, you'll get to stay full time. So many opportunities yeah. if you can write and produce well. That's absolutely correct. I wanted to take a few more questions from people who are watching us right now. Uh, we have a question, and Jenny, this question is for you. It is from um, Uni Adithan, uh, which who wants you asks, uh, which um, are the tools that are used to verify the news? So we're going to take a step back to where we were a little bit earlier in this um, panel, and I think you had mentioned verification. What are some of the tools that you 
Well, I, I noticed that uh, I think Daph mentioned quite a few that we, we use these of video uh, verification tools in in bit is a is a good one to check out um, any, you know, difference in compression uh, in, in videos. Can you say that one again? Invid. Oh, so, Invid. Uh, yeah. And, and um, ID. Yeah, uh, the photo forensic is, is, is another yes. one. Um, obviously, um, simple uh, re reverse image searches on, on I, I tend to ask the students to use different search engines, you know, so we use obviously Google, we use Baidu, which is a Chinese search engine, and, and Yandex, which is the Russian uh, search engine. So it's, it's a, there's no there's no single tool as such. It's, I like teaching that because it's kind of like a puzzle. You know, you, you kind of have to think um, if this if this tool doesn't work, then maybe it's it's uh, it is fake in a different way. There is there is no magical tool that will solve anything. And by the way, the main problem with tools is that, is that they get outdated really quickly. Tools that work six months ago, no longer work now, <laughs> you know. And I think so. this is where news literacy comes in also, which we've discovered very few of our students have those skills, news literacy skills, where they can go and find the source themselves without uh, relying on a tool. They can actually figure it out themselves. Yeah. Um, we have a question, I think, from uh, somebody also from, uh, like from, um, no, nope, not from ACJ, I, I can't tell. But the question is, this is also from Uni. Nowadays, uh, mobile is a powerful studio to share the news content. So is there any platform for mobile journalism to take part? And Fred, this question is for you. Is there any platform for mobile journalism to take part to share the news content at your college, Coventry University? Um. Yes, there is. Uh, I mean, there is quite a number of um, uh, the methods that we currently, uh, one of the techniques that we currently teach is Mojo, uh, uh, mobile journalism. And um, I mean, we've got, we've, I mean, there are a number, to, to do it effectively, there are certain um, ad additional kits that you might need. And as part of um, the kit that the university provides, uh, for instance, apart from the laptop and Adobe Creative uh, Clouds. Uh, one of the things that the, in the area of journalism, uh, we normally give the students are uh, accessories that make it easier, for instance, to capture audio while using mobile journalism and also introduce to students a specific um, um, you know, software that can be used for editing. And I think uh, Dev already covered quite a number of these when he was, uh, when he was speaking. So we, are, we actually, within Coventry University in the media loan shop um, our studio, we've got um, a mobile uh, broadcast uh, kit that uh, you know, you can have a, a, a broadcast a radio, particularly audio broadcast studio. You can pitch it anywhere, and 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 you use it using mobile devices. So that's a key aspect of what we currently offer. Excellent. Um, I think I want to make sure I didn't miss somebody here, but Dave, just um, let us know that the latest edition of Verification Tools is out. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, Dave? You'll have to unmute. Uh, yeah, uh, I just uh, shared the link. Uh, it's uh, edited by you. You, you must be familiar with it. They've been uh, verification tools. Great, Silverman has been uh, editing this uh, for uh, for the last three, four years. And the latest edition of uh, verification tools in that book uh, is out. Uh, last week is free to download, and I just sent the link in the group. And it's called Data so, Journalism. Uh, they talk about a lot of uh, data, data journalism. Yeah, the link uh, you can. Yeah, so I, I think yeah, that I'll, share it. I'll just can you make I, it public? I'm, I'm, I'm just going just to put it. In. I'll put it up on the uh, YouTube channel too, um, but it's datajournalism.com yeah. slash read slash handbook slash verification hyphen three. So yeah, that's going to be a great. I, I don't know anything about it. What does it do? Yeah. It's there for everyone. Oh, oh yeah. great. Excellent. So here, uh, data. Uh, yes. Yeah, verification has been actually, you can't say one tool, you can do pretty much everything with one tool that doesn't, doesn't work like that. Uh, you remember, you know, just uh, there was a time when um, 
uh, one of my when I was working in the Middle East, one of my job was uh, for a platform. One of my job was to uh, to to bust in the biggest. Uh, those were the days when Osama bin Laden was uh, just putting up a lot of videos, or rather audio audio tapes. And one of my job was to verify the sound. And in order to do that, you know, I had to learn Arabic. And uh, he sounds and there was no technology. And we are talking about the mid 90s. And there was no technology. And I've been fooled several times by this. Uh, you know, people were faking Osama bin Laden's uh, voice. And they were putting up, you know, in the 90s, there were a lot of audio tapes you know, threatening to blow up everything. And now, look at it. You guys, it will have to be a combination of uh, image. Dev froze. Okay, I'm going to go over to Jenny, who also mentioned photo forensic. We lost Dev for a second. Yeah, so photo forensic is, uh, is basically, you know, you could, you could put in a, a JPEG or, or, or a PNG um, or, or just a URL, a video URL. So what it's looking for is um, what well, primarily is, is photographs. Um, because if, if, it, if, it's a, if a photo has been doctored, the compression um, rate of the images would be, would be different. So suppose I, I, I put a flower on, on top of a, a, a field and the flower is, is imposed, the compression rate is different. So we're, that's, it's, it's, it's basically a, a tool that analyzes images that way. Um, uh, Invit, Invit is, is a little bit like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Snopes, um, uh, which is yeah. a, right, which is a, which is a, a, a site that, that um, you know, uh, aggregates yeah, that. Um, yeah, so so Invit does that, and and also it has a bunch of uh, digital tools as well. Again, you know, looking at the uh, video frame by frame, um, are there are there cuts? Uh, are there images that comes into the video that that um, looks like it, it's added? I find you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're both useful, but. But then again, you know, there is no foolproof tool. <laughs> right. Um, I'm looking to see, I think that Kelly just mentioned, uh, which I'm not familiar with also, Google's yeah. Flourish Studio. It's a tool to produce data interactive. So we teach that a lot. We'll have students do infographics. Data is now a required part of our multimedia journalism in addition to audio, photos, video, the traditional. And Flourish, you build your own Excel spreadsheet, upload it into this free online tool, and it magically creates interactive line graphs, pie graphs, maps. It's a very nice tool and it's free. Good. And uh, I put a link in the chat. And also, um, Deb has a floor in the studio. And one of the unique, one of the unique features, one of the unique features of Flourish Studio we actively use is the butter, the animation. You can animate the bar chart race, and uh, there is a VR. Now they've just started a VR visualization, so which can be very handy in uh, AR and VR. You can actually create visualizations, and with the headset, you can make them interactive. And this so is also Flourish is Flourish. super good and is owned by Google, and no less. Okay, mm. and also it's free. Yes, and Flourish, free. Flourish Studio. Flourish. Okay. And it's free. That's always great. Guardian uses it a lot. It is free. It is free. It is free. And it's very good to create animated uh, visualizations for uh, social media, for Twitter, you know, the charts and bars running around and um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I think one of the other things that we need to talk about in addition to just the whole idea of um, the, the opportunities that we have being able to teach our students how to uh, create community journalism and get their message out there. We also get into the whole idea of um, censorship and inciting online. Uh, in other words, if we don't allow people to have certain speech, are we censoring them? If we do allow them to have that speech, are they inciting violence? Which is something that we have seen over the past couple of months and years uh, with those people that do have access to be able to say anything, whether it's on 4chan or 8chan or whether it is on a, uh, a cable program where there are no restrictions or limitations. Does anybody want to take that one? I think, Dan, you and I had discussed that. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. Um, as you know, we had some um, 
uh, protests here in Hong Kong uh, in between June uh, last year and, and December primarily. And, and, and these are, uh, you know, it has a lot of support from college age uh, people, uh, students, M many of them are students. And so it was very difficult for, for some of them to, to see uh, the bias uh, and, and their own opinions in, in doing these interviews, right? They would do interviews and, and uh, uh, they, you know, they, they didn't really want to see the other side of the political spectrum. Um, I find that that's a, a problem with, with, with many, um, you know, students um, where I am. I mean, do, do you find that? You, you know, they, it's, I think it's just the fact that, you know, their age group, when, you, when you're 19, um, you, you're just so engrossed in this social media that you're just in that echo chamber. You just can't see beyond it. Well, yeah. that other term, which is the filter bubble, you know, they're, they're looking for the things they're interested in and they're looking in the places that they're used to looking in and they're not looking anywhere else. So one of the biggest problems I have with my students is getting them to find more than one source for something. And they will go and the first person they talk to, done. Um, and then I say to them, well, are there any other points of view? And uh, what other perspectives can you find? So they're, again, mine are not journalism students, but they're not very good at digging and they're not very good at doing those basics of journalism that we may all have been used to doing in our own professional practices, which is if, 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 if one person that you phone up says to you, yes, the sky is falling, you don't go to air with it. So um, it's, it's, it's a continuing struggle with me to get them to, um, as you talked about verification faith, but also just digging and, and, um, and going deeper than the surface of Google and finding other places to go searching. And as uh, someone else mentioned earlier, their terror of using the phone, um, their <laughs> inability to pick up the phone and make a cold call. Um, yeah. I had a student say to me, well, what if someone answered? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to phone at 10 o'clock at night when I know she's not there. So, and so I had to talk them through how to make a phone call. So with all of their amazing technical skills, there are some things that are also being lost in their ability to communicate um, oh. really clearly and effectively and go out and find a variety of answers to the question. And, and we laugh it? about that, Marion, but it is a problem. I think it was more of a problem when we were doing our traditional newscasts. Now that they're online, they feel more comfortable doing a Zoom interview with someone than they did doing an in-person interview. And Bruce, you had something to say. I did. One of the things, and we came across this just uh, last week when one of our students was uh, interviewing an activist group and got the, got the CEO of the activist group. And I tell my students, as one of the things, you have to go into every story uh, and ask yourself, okay, uh, what's their agenda? And a lot of times both sides have an agenda and you have to recognize that that's a possibility and then figure out whether that's the case or not. Sometimes they aren't, but if you're talking to an attorney, he's got an agenda to help as a client. If you're talking to someone with a political group, they've got an agenda that they want to push and you have to recognize those. And, uh, and, and that's one of the questions we make them ask going into those interviews. So, yeah. Did anybody else want to touch on that subject? I have a big question to ask of everyone. I just wanted to add a, a little bit about uh, one of the issues that uh, students particularly struggle with is cons consent, particularly for broadcast um, uh, work. And one of the uh, most difficult situations we find ourselves in, particularly in the area of activism, is that the younger, new younger activists who express themselves, and some of them are just turning 18 or even under 18. I don't know what the experiences of others are, but we, um, you know, we, it is important that students think through, particularly the explicit uh, informed consent that students, uh, that they get from their uh, sources or subjects, particularly if it's on a sensitive matter. And our university has become relatively strict on that particular issue. Uh, in, and we, I mean, for, for us as journalists, we find it a bit onerous, but it's one of the things that we, 
uh, we students feel that is a burden and they probably shouldn't have to do, but we still get them to think about it. Um, I, what the other the question that I wanted to ask was um, one of the, um, let me see if I can focus on this, one of the issues that we decided we were going to talk about when we all came together and said, hey, we want to talk about what we've experienced and what our students have experienced, but also where do we think news and media are headed after things get back to semi-normal. We now see the network news and even local news broadcasting from their homes, not using the studio, doing different disruptive kinds of uh, journalism that was not even thought possible before COVID-19 happened. So I wanted to kind of toss it out to everybody and see who would like to address that. Where do you see us going? And who wants to start? Okay, April. I'll, I'll go. Yeah. Oh, I just sighed heavily. Um, I, I think personally, just from trying to educate myself in order to educate the students um, and as a practitioner, that I think it will be a combination. If you look at, you know, shows like even American Idol over there in America, um, you know, they're sending packages to contested or competitors homes and they're doing their own lighting and it makes them feel more a part of the show. And they're already a little bit media savvy anyway. Um, at the same token, I think that, um, yeah, it'll be a combination. We can't replace the traditional studio. And like I mentioned, when we all spoke the other day, those impromptu meetings, that human touch, that human connection, you know, the best ideas are, you know, born out of us feeding off of each other and not in this way. It's slightly uncomfortable. Like I, maybe for the students in the younger generation, they're more comfortable, but you know, they're not fully running the show yet. So I think it will be a combination of using, you know, the beautiful lights and the studios and, you know, everything that we had um, and taking the opportunity if somebody can't come to the studio or cost savings, um, you know, saving money on budgets, but you can't re replace a beautiful, you know, shiny studio with Simon Cowell, for example. <laughs> I know that uh, Dev would argue with you on that one, but I'm going to go to Sally first and ask her to talk about court reporting and how that has changed, and it has significantly in the U.S. Yes, I just wanted to think about going forward how um, our public institutions are going to be covered because um, you know council meetings, court cases are all taking part, taking place sort of behind closed doors now. Now some of them are digitally available, and that's meant you know there's been a massive move to go um to film uh court cases which has been very controversial in the uk and we haven't done very much of it and now suddenly things are online and digital courts are available that means in some ways that journalists have more access to these proceedings potentially and um considering our research shows that there was very little court reporting beforehand and now um well this might mean that we'll have more court reporting if you can join proceedings digitally. But it also might mean that we have less access because if we can't be, that, that's not available, then law, you know, justice is being done behind closed doors. And it's a quite, a, it's a very live subject in the UK at the moment about this idea of open justice and how I think that we are going to see a lot more digital courts even after the pandemic, but we need to kind of really monitor how that affects journalists access to things like courts and council meetings and local government meetings, those kind of things. So that's that's what I say. I think that that needs a close, we need to keep a close eye on that um, when we come out of the pandemic and the lockdown. Yeah, um, I agree with you. I think that our government officials and courts have become very comfortable with uh, physical distancing now and the fact that they are not being seen or questioned. Kelly, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, and there we go. You got Zoom bombed by a child. <laughs> Very quick thought. Now I need to look for my dog to have her come into the shot. Uh, quick thought on courts. Um, we made history this week because of the pandemic. The Supreme Court for the first time ever allowed an audio transmission of, uh, of question and answer. And in fact, Clarence Thomas, Associate Justice, has been known for years for never asking a question at these. And yet because of the way the Chief Justice organized it, he actually asked several questions for the first time in years. A Couple of, of very tumultuous changes in our courts. I think a lot of reporters are gonna to continue to have the flexibility now 
to report from home. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, uh, photojournalists at newspapers used to have to go to work, get their assignments, pick up equipment, go out. That stopped many years ago. They would just get assignments the evening before, go directly to assignments and shoot. That happens now with the videographers. I think increasingly we'll see that with reporters, that they'll have assignments, they'll go report, they'll edit, they'll submit. They may not go to the studio for days at a time. I think it'll be an interesting change. And I think, um, let me see, Kelly. Oh, that was Kelly. Um, Deb, I know, where did he go? Because he has talked a lot about the fact that the newsroom is not necessary any longer. And it looks like I'm looking at my participant list. Oh, he's here. He's just off for a moment. But, but that is true. It, it shows us that it's not necessary really to be in a newsroom. However, there was a news anchor last week who said to me when I asked about some of the stations having their anchors anchoring from home uh, and their reporters uh, only in their homes or but not in the studio. And the, the news anchor who was anchoring from the studio said, I think it looks terrible, very unprofessional. Have we, are we being asked to lower our standards or is this a necessary part of getting the word out? And Bruce, you have your hand up. I think, I think it's, I'm hoping that it's, it's not going to be the norm because I think that environment in the newsroom is so valuable for students starting out their career. And I used to not recommend students if they were offered a bureau job. Uh, for for a newsroom to to not accept that because oftentimes you're out on an island and you don't get to bounce things off as me, uh, your news director as often or other people and I I think that the camaraderie in a newsroom the learning opportunities is so much greater so you know I know cost is a factor in everything that they'll look at that but I hope the newsroom environment doesn't go away because that's that's a huge part of the learning. Uh, for for young reporters and young producers and people getting into the business, absolutely, Marion. What are your thoughts? Well, one of the one of the things I don't like about the studio and news is the glamorization of it. And when on CNN, Brooke Baldwin was home with COVID. Well, my goodness, there she is without her makeup at home, looking like a real human being. And what I get really tired of in certainly Canadian and American TV newsrooms is the all gussied up, full of makeup, all the female anchors looking like they're dressed to go out to party. And what I liked about people being at home is they looked like real human beings and not like they were trying to be movie stars. So, you know, I've, um, and on all the late night talk shows and everything, I've been so happy to see real human beings and not them looking like they're spackled with 10 feet of makeup. So it's one of the things I don't miss about the studios going away at all. I, I have to agree with you. Maybe the pendulum is going to swing the other way. I'm not sure, but April, you, you noticed something different in the Netherlands. Yeah, no, just, just to make a point that we're an international panel. So it's really interesting um, the way the approach to news and especially what I observe has happened in America in the past four years from afar um, is that there's a completely different approach um, to how news is delivered here. I don't see it at all or experience it as a form of entertainment and the gussied up anchors and the showgirls or whatever. <laughs> it's just very pragmatic. This is the news. We're delivering it. They're wearing jeans with a blazer. They're telling you what happened. You know, the cameras are robotics generally and, um, you know, we don't have that that big in your face, um, you know, networks competing and screaming and four people talking over each other. It's just trashy, in my opinion. It just seems to be very civilized and delivering the news. So probably for this conversation, I don't know how it is in Hong Kong, you know, or in Chennai, but um, that or the UK even, I think it's a little more like here in the Netherlands. Um, I don't miss that aspect of news news entertainment if there's a term that exists i don't know mm. I it, it, infotainment definitely the monetizing of it yeah. and getting getting people to tune in and i think sex sells and and that's where they seem to be coming from uh marion did it's you i'm like, like, oh, sorry. sorry i didn't see yeah, that can I just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yes dead yeah just a quick thing you know when we are talking about uh, news uh, you know just i have a problem with um, 
a lot of you getting fixated with the uh, flat screen television. Okay, when we are talking, when we are talking about visual stories, we are talking about uh, stories produced for the mobile phones and for the web as well for the apps. So when you have, when you are talking about the flat screen, okay, and uh, I, what is the difference between the user experience with that? When our flat screen, it's a lean back experience which is um, uh, passive, whereas when with the phone in your hand, it is a lean on lean forward experience which is very active so when you create content for your phone you'll have to be a little more informal you'll have to be a little more chatty it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation it's not just talking to 10 people mass communication this is one person talking to another person because you are consuming content on the phone you're in the loo you're in the bed you're at the Starbucks. you're ready for a bus you're a tube you're watching so it's, you have to communicate like one person talking to another person so there's a problem when you're talking about you'll have to define what is what exactly is visual story storytelling is it for the flat screen or is it for a phone smartphone so for me mobile journalism is creating content for the mobile consumption as well as now bbc like bbc is doing quite well with the you know for their creating for broadcast as well so that's where this comes in people is it's too people are too good to be believable on the studio so, for example, you know, see what Vice News is doing. You know, if you, have, if you can take you back a little few a couple of years ago when they how they covered that the Charlottesville, you know, that uh, that thing in Charlottesville, I forgot them. Uh, on Vice so News, the, right. a little, yeah, Vice News, and it's the Vice News is not broadcast television, but it's visual platform. So, what are we talking about here? What could what audience are we talking about here? So, we need to actually define that um, before we talk about all this thing. That's my point. Can disagree? Hello, babe. <laughs> um, Jenny, I think that April had asked what type of, um, what type of, uh, uh, April, you were basically talking about how the United mm -hmm. States seems to stand out um, with the type of news that is projected on television. And she mentioned she didn't know how Hong Kong or um, other countries experience this with their news anchors or their hosts. What do you see in Hong Kong? Um, there is a there is a, a, a level of uh, glamorization. Um, uh, we we do see uh, people who who are a news anchor later becoming um, what they call key opinion leaders here, me meaning you know the the YouTube stars. They they basically they start off in, in television to make their names and then they they move on to do other things. There there is that. Uh, but I, I, I personally, I personally don't think that's um, sustainable, not just in Hong Kong, but uh, anywhere in the wo world, because these television stations are just not getting uh, the commercials uh, that they used to. Um, and well, I, I mean, I, th I think that's a, the, a problem with for, for news outlets in general is that, you, you know, um, one newspaper here in Hong Kong, the South China Morning Post, they've, they've had an amazing number of views over the past few months, in fact, over the past year, but they can't change it, they can't monetize that. And that's a problem. Um, it, you know, it's, it's high quality journalism, but people are just not willing to pay for it. Uh, and and, and the, to, to the point about the anchors, um, it's, it's the same thing. Are, are people actually going to pay these TV stations for the advertising to to watch that? I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't know. Do Do you think they will? Do you think Do you think it's sustainable? <laughs> it hasn't worked yet. The ratings continue to go down, except for in the middle of COVID nineteen, we are seeing much more consumption of traditional broadcast news. Mary hmm. had one more point to make, and. We have about 15 minutes left. What I would like to do after Marion speaks is to go around um, for final thoughts about what we have experienced, what you are thinking that will be happening next, whatever. I'm just going to open it up to everyone. So Jenny. Um, I'll, you, did you want me to make my point? Yeah, and then your point, And then if you want to um, wrap make, it up I'll with. My point, I'll make my final point and then I'll shut yeah. up. Um, my one point was um, Canada's news is somewhere between what April's talking about in the Netherlands and the United States. I just want to say four of our national anchors are a female 
and be over 50. So um, it's one of the things I like about turning on the TV news in Canada is that there are, um, you know, it, it's not all people who look like Barbie. Um, and my final point I was going to make before we do the round table, going back to Global News Relay and my own project, Global Campus Studio. One of the things we are doing right now is something I want more of from our students when we do our projects. My project is all about international online collaboration. And often, you know, with Global News Relay, our students work by themselves. And the only ones in Global News Relay, um, Jenny's two students are the only ones that got to meet the other students. <clears throat> in my Global Campus Studio, the shows are done collaboratively, but again, the only students who get to meet other students are the ones who are the hosts and sometimes the writers. So I would like to put out the challenge that when I do my next international collaborative shows, I want our students to be talking to each other more, collaborating with each other more, learning from each other more. It's hard because our semesters are different, our time zones are different, our curricular needs and requirements are different. But I really feel like there's a lot to be gained by having people from everywhere discussing their similarities and differences. And I want that for our students going forward. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mary and Fred. You had a comment about glamorization and then your final thoughts as well. Yeah, I think um, uh, sometimes uh, when, thank you, for, so when students uh, join a journalism course, uh, the problem is sometimes they they view journalism as the TV glamorized TV presenter, and uh, they that is all they think they want to do, and that's all they want to be taught, and they want to spend time doing that. And you know, journalism is not is not about that um, alone. Other things, uh, for instance, writing and some of the things we've already talking, talked about needs to be taken into account. My final point uh, is more to revisit the issue of. Um, um, fact checking and verification and linking it back to the skills that are required of modern uh, or current journalists. I think this is one thing that we all need to include in most of our curricula. In uh, Coventry University, we tend to get external um, you know, organizations to come and co-deliver some of these sessions. Specifically, we've been getting in, uh, 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 you know, people from Google News uh, Initiative, as well as uh, Center for Investigative Journalism. So that's one area, because there's a lot of so-called fake news flying around. And there, it doesn't need to be too technical. Sometimes it's very basic checks of logos, um, you know, so, I mean, uh, you know, s certain things within a, a piece of text for you to identify maybe it is not legit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fred. Fred from Coventry University. Kelly from Texas State. I think we'll see an increase in mobile. We'll see an increase in portable tools. So Adobe Creative Cloud, tools like we see from Google. And Google has a robust suite of tools to support reporting. I think all of those things are going to make it less and less necessary for people to be in a newsroom. I think they're going to expand opportunities to work remotely, mobily. And so I think we're going to see growth in that. I understand the expense, the look, the interaction of being in a studio, being in a newsroom. And of course I've spent many years in that situation, but that's what I think the future bears is we're gonna see a big increase in mobile and social media reporting. And I also think we're gonna see on the edge of pro-am, amateur professional bloggers, people create their own brands on social media and they're gonna be around the edges of news reporting, even as what we think of as legacy media maybe contracts a little bit. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And then April from Breda in the Netherlands. Just um, my final thought would be now that we've had this panel, I just had this idea that occurred to me that it would be so interesting to have some kind of platform for international faculty that come together on something like uh, if you all are familiar with the new um, app that just launched called Quibi, where there's a couple billion dollars worth of uh, you know, funds pumped in to by some former Disney execs to create short form content, entertainment, not news, um, you know, for, you know, for millennials, but it would be so fun to have some kind of, you know, platform for international teachers to give 
you know, short knowledge clips where if you're a media student somewhere around the world, oh, I want to know, oh, here, there's Kelly. He's got a 10 minute quick bite of, um, you know, some expertise on mobile producing, or we want to talk about court reporting. We can go to this quick bite. And then we, we could in the end be this sort of database that we're all kind of constantly updating and it would, could be an app. I don't know. I'm, I don't know how we would monetize that, but anyway, that was just um, kind of my final thought. And in terms of the um, uh, collaborating on news uh, programs like Global News Relay and Marion's Project and all the other ones popping up, I agree wholeheartedly about um, collaboration um, and some ideas we can discuss maybe offline, but it can be just maybe it's students pitching to other lecturers and having everybody you know, uh, attend that. Now that we know that this works, why couldn't I, I've had Marion pop into my classes a number of times and many other things, but I would love to have any number of you um, come in live and then the students um, could also meet in this way, um, despite time zones, because we're all used to it now. And then we have a truly international newsroom. So. Um, I, I really love that offer. I think that we should all make ourselves available to one another to be able to do just that to have guest speakers in or also to help find guest speakers from um, our various cities. Andrew, final thoughts. Yeah, mine really tallies with what April just said. I'm a big believer in that. I think what we've done as a profession has been rather caught cold by the quick advance of the media. So you're, you're over faced with the stuff that comes onto social media. And in our profession, we see straight through it and go, well, that's obviously ridiculous. But Joe Public can't in the main, and, and that's what we've seen with Cambridge Analytica, that's what we've seen with um, international interference in domestic elections and so on. So I'm all for anything that allows this kind of collaboration. I definitely take part in it because the journalism has now become international. The, the falsity, the falsehoods have become international, and, and I think that we have to be international in response to that. So who's better placed than, than uh, a mixture of, of actual journalists and academics uh, to counter that. So yeah, I'm up for that. I think it's a great idea. And I, and I think maybe if this is a starting place for it, that's an excellent legacy. Excellent. And uh, Sally. Get to, um, yeah, I echo that. I, I'd be very interested in more of these kind of international collaborations. Um, just from my point of view, I, I think reflecting on COVID-19, it, it, it's been extraordinary how innovative and creative and problem solving um, it has been that students have, have done lots of things that I never thought they would and so have staff. I've, I've learned a lot um, and I suppose the one thing I think about going forward from a teaching point of view that I think we really need to think about how to kind of level the playing field for those students who have not got the resources um, that we assume they have um, and I think you know, we've talked about that earlier, but I think that we need to keep that in mind when we, when we go back to a sort of normal, um, it'll be easy for that sort of poverty to be covered up again. And I think we shouldn't, we should keep that in mind. Anyway, thank you for inviting me. Oh, Sally, thank you so much. And you know, when, when I was having technical difficulties in the very beginning, I did not get to run your video. So I do want to do that right now. Um, and you can tell us a little bit about it. It's very short. So hold on one second. And let me get that up on the screen. And um, I hope, whoops, I remembered that I have to, because is the sound important or should I run it without the sound? No, it's just music. Cause it's, it's this was a piece made by, um, all our students had to do a kind of one minute social video on life in lockdown. Um, okay. And um, this was one done by one of our third years. Um, Here it goes. Using Kinemas. <laughs>
<laughs> well done. Yeah, a lot of it's not the most um, uh, uh, serious journalism, but it, it was a kind of sweet little piece of, of how people are managing. Right. Well, you know, and since we're on the topic, and I also did not get to show Kelly's from Texas State when we talk about, and this is also because it's media production and it shows a lot of different angles and a lot of different shots. So I'm gonna run yours as well, Kelly, if you don't mind, and you, if you wanna talk about that too. Uh, this is an assignment that my students have to do to avoid jump cuts. So the assignment is to get from <laughs> here to there in as creative or silly a way as possible. I always do an example video. This is one of my sample videos. All right, jump cuts, the dreaded jump cuts, here we go. <laughs> awesome. So tell us about that. So my students always do this. I do examples because it's just easier for them to sort of grasp if they can see it rather than me talking about it. And I have a number of examples, mine and students. Uh, it's an exercise that happens very early in the semester. It's entirely shot, edited, and published from the phone. And then when they go out and do more traditional stories, rule of thirds framing with interviews, B-roll of, uh, of um, stories they're covering, this sort of sets the stage for how to go about shooting that in such a way as to avoid jump cuts. Ironically, this semester, it was really valuable that we did that assignment early because the students ended up finishing the semester working with their phones. By the way, one other future thing that I didn't mention that I should is I think emerging media, uh, drones, 360 cameras. We have those, we have small ones that are FAA exempt that we operate with, with phone apps, wearables. I think all of those things are gonna robustly emerge in the next few years also. Okay, great. We want to hear more about that too, if you can put that information up. And uh, Dan. I'll, I'll keep mine short and sweet. Um, the idea or the big thing that I've taken away from this is really truly how creative our students are. Um, that if you give them the opportunity and give them the chance to have a little bit of freedom and I am a control freak, right? I, I'm from television, so I'm used to time and, and you will meet this time and all that, right? But letting them go was hard for me. Um, but seeing what they've done has really, really quite, um, quite impressed me um, with their creativity and their ability to think on the fly. All those things that we've run into, you know, the making of the phone call and all that, I, I found that some of them, this has forced them to do that because they're, you know, they're on their own a little bit um, in that, that moment. So, you know, I think that, that it's shown how creative they are. And, and one of the projects that we did uh, in visual storytelling was that they had to do a video diary, show us what's happening um, with your life. And it was really fascinating to hear what's going on in their life, these little stories that, you know, normally we're not gonna know about in an environment, in, in, a, in a classroom, because they're not, a lot of them don't tell us this stuff. Um, but it allowed them to really show that. So that was a lot of fun um, and very interesting too. So uh, that, that, that's my takeaway from this whole thing. And, you know, thank you all, everybody, you know, uh, for letting us be a part of it at Texas State. And hopefully next year, we'll, we'll have some more stories for you as opposed to this year. <laughs> that's all right. Your students are awesome. And the stories they've done in the past have been fantastic. Bruce. Oops, let me unmute you. Oops. There we go. Uh, I told students, I'll make this real quick. This is, for many of them, this is the biggest story that they will ever cover, this COVID-19. And so it's given them a chance to think out of the box. It was an opportunity for them to be creative and, and write some new ways to do things And because this is uncharted territory for just about everybody. And so... I think it was an opportunity for them. And I agree with what Dan said. It's been interesting seeing their create creativity. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest takeaways from this moving forward. And I appreciate the panel and the chance to participate in this. A lot of good stuff. Thank you. I, I agree very much. Let me see. Um, Deb. 
Yeah, cute thing, you know, just uh, the takeaway from me, from as far as I'm concerned, is uh, um, I think it's time we, you and I, you know, we together, we disrupted the classroom first. And we had to dismantle this. And by dismantling that, you know, we could actually instill this idea from the students we are teaching and that they go and they have to dismantle the newsrooms. One of the reasons when I got into teaching is because I've been a journalist for 27 years, but I just went around the world trying to change the world at the next stage. So I thought of getting into teaching so that you, know, you get to actually screw, screw 60 students' mind and at least these 60 students to the world and they go and disrupt the news. So this time we dismantle, disrupt the news and by doing so, this, uh, dismantling the classroom first, then by doing so, dismantling the news. Because this is an opportunity for us to change, to transform journalism, to take journalism to the next level. Something which is very different and exciting for the young people. And if we don't disrupt ourselves, if we don't do this, somebody else is going to do it for us. So we just don't want that to happen. And I would also like to, before we wrap up, I just would like to invite all of you up to school for our next pop-up newsroom. So the truly international, actually, it's a, it's a live reporting thing. So, well, I have the emails now. We'll invite all of you to this, uh, to the non students. That would be fantastic. We've been part of the- this uh, opportunity, Faith and Dan. We've been part of the, the pop-up newsroom for many years now with Dev, and it's a great experience for our students. And I encourage you all to be involved in that as well. Jenny. Um, I think this kind of collaboration is invaluable, not only just for faculty, but also for our students, because because for the students, um, this is this is the, the the world that they will face. This when they when when they start their career, it's not just in Hong Kong, in whatever city, whatever town is the world they have to work with. Uh, but as far as journalism is concerned, I don't think um, just being online can ever replace that that trust that you need as a journalist to get people to tell you the story. So I think that. Yeah, online it's valuable, but but the face-to-face -face stuff is what will keep journalism uh, alive. I I have to agree. Did um did I miss anybody? Did everybody get final thoughts in? I want to say thank you to all of you. As you can see, we all have a lot in common, no matter where we are. This is six countries, eleven universities, and most of us have been together since 2014, I think, when. I came into the Global News Relay. It was started at Salford University in 2013 and with Sarah Jones, right, Andrew? And um, it's been such a benefit, I think, to our students at Fresno State and to me. It's been a, a benefit for me as a professor because I have been able to meet all of you and I feel as though, even though I've never met you in person, except for Marion, that you are all my friends and go way beyond colleagues. And I just appreciate all of the hard work and the dedication you have toward journalism, toward your students. And I realize not all of you are journalism professors, but we're all storytellers and that's all part of it. I know someone said that a little bit earlier. So this is our common thread, why we got together, but also teaching and education and that we all care for our students as well. The reason we are together is because of the Global News Relay. I do want to say thank you all so much. This has been a real pleasure. I think it's been enlightening. I hope that um, we continue to learn from our students and that our students continue to do the best news and get the best information out because we need their help as much as possible. Journalism is so important. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks all. Bye.